Namaste. One of the surprising and unexpected things that I learned by reading Shankaracharya's books, especially his commentaries on the Upanishads and Vedanta Sutra or Brahma Sutra, is how to have a discussion. Now, this is one of the funny things because Shankaracharya never says, okay, now I'm going to teach you how to have a discussion. <laughs> he shows you how to have a discussion. And there are one or two purports where he discusses it a little bit. And one of the very interesting things he says is that there are basically three kinds of discussions. One kind is of a friendship nature where there's nothing to be lost or gained, no point to be made. It's pure uh, hanging out, pure pleasure. And another kind of discussion is one where one party is trying to defeat or convince or change the behavior of the other. And this he calls contentious discussion. And then there's a third type of discussion where the participants may take up different points of view and may argue different uh, logical arguments based on evidence huh? to try to come to the truth. Now, this, he says, is the only type of discussion worth participating in. In other words, a really wise person, a really intelligent person, never tries to coerce or defeat another. And so the very first principle of Vedic discussion is politeness. There is no attempt to try to bully or insult or cut off or uh, call the other person by some name or epithet. Uh, there's no attempt to, you know, uh, cast shade <laughs> on the other. Rather, there is an earnest and serious mood to try to find out what is the real truth here? What is the real truth about this subject? So the discussants, discussors, the people talking to each other, have different ways of expressing themselves according to their points of view. And ultimately, all points of view resolve to the four states of consciousness, uh, as we have so often referred. So, in essence, any discussion to try to determine the truth is going to be a contrast between the views and experiences of different states of consciousness. But there is one rule that is... Uh, absolutely necessary in all types of discussion, and especially the discussion to try to reach the truth. And that is to show, to acknowledge, and to even repeat your understanding of your opponent's view. Now, we see this in Shankaracharya's writing, that in his commentary, he is trying to defeat the opposing views. But if you read the Upanishads themselves, the Upanishads themselves only recount conversations meant to arrive at the truth, where both parties are sympathetic to one another. But in either case, Shankaracharya shows in the very beginning of his answers, of his responses, that he knows what the opposition's point of view is, he understands it, and he can even express it and argue it in very convincing terms. <laughs> so this is the genius, you see. This is the great thing about Vedic discussions. 
Actual Vedic discussion begins by acknowledging your partners and their points of view and demonstrating by explaining it that you understand them, that you got it. And if you don't do that, the other person can just cut off the discussion because you have violated one of the supreme laws or tenets of this kind of discussion, a discussion meant to find the Dharma, to find the truth in any situation. So let me give an example. This happens to me all the time here on the channel that someone will post um, an understanding coming from a very different set of views, you know, uh, and they'll post a view of their own or of an opinion without referencing any, uh, you know, Vedic authorities or even uh, personalities. So-and-so said such-and-such. They just put it out there. Hey, this is what I think. Huh? And it's different from what you think. Well, right away, this person is asking for an argument or even asking to terminate the discussion. Because that's what I do a lot of the times when people come on like this. I just delete it. <laughs> Obviously, they have not understood my point of view. So how can they even begin to argue against it? See, at that level, it's just one opinion against another, one person's view against another person's view. And that doesn't lead to any kind of satisfactory conclusion ever. Does it? Has it in your experience? Not in mine. So I don't really want to hear your point of view until you have shown that you get my point of view. See, like just today it happened. I had made a video about a certain type of meditation. And of course, we always go back to the four states of consciousness introduced in Mandukya Upanishad. And we always explain everything in terms of these four states of consciousness. So then this guy comes on with a, a comment that, you know, in uh, the yoga school, it's not like that. Oh, yeah, it was Kundalini. He was saying that Kundalini yoga is the way to, you know, raise the Kundalini and get the benefits. But, you know, if you read the books by people who tried this, they all went through a lot of suffering. Uh, like Gopi Krishna, people like that. And the reason for that is <laughs> they are trying to superimpose the Jagrat consciousness, which is their regular, everyday, egoistic, willful, you know, uh, mental-based uh, uh, consciousness trying to get what they want. And they're trying to superimpose that on the Kundalini, which is Svapna consciousness as a goddess. Any god or goddess is a metaphor, a symbol. And they are encountered in Svapna, which is dreams or thoughts. Isn't it? I mean, you never see goddess Kundalini just walking down the street. Never. But if you go inside and you superimpose, you know, the yoga system and the chakra system and all that on your inner experience of the body, you will find Kundalini as sure as can be, residing in the Muladhara chakra and circulating the prana throughout the body. She doesn't need any, any raising, you know? She's already a rose. <laughs> She's already circulating throughout the body as prana, or you wouldn't be alive. You wouldn't be healthy. So don't tell me that Kundalini needs to be raised. No, but what raising Kundalini is actually about is attaining samadhi. And samadhi is attained through silence and emptiness and nothingness, sushupti. 
So if you really want to raise Kundalini, see, what you do is to realize Kundalini as the self. And when you do that, she will automatically respond out of love, out of affection, out of understanding, out of sympathy. See, so the real uh, method of meditation and, and kundalini and all of this is actually bhakti. It's actually in svapna consciousness. And to try to superimpose a jagrat idea of, oh, I'm going to sit like this and I'm going to breathe like this and I'm going to visualize this and that and this chakra and the other thing. And whew, after all that, what's going to be the result? Kundalini is going to be irritated. She's going to be angry, disturbed. And disturbance of prana leads to illness, ill feelings. See, these are all things they don't teach you in the books. You can only learn this by practice. You can only learn this by sitting down and actually doing it. Of course, intuition, instinct, all of these things are good guidance. You should follow them. But also know that the overriding principle of everything is love and compassion. So if you disagree with something or someone, either here on the channel or out there in life or whatever, the first thing you have to do is convince them that you understand their position, their point of view. And then you can say, you can come back and say, but wouldn't it be better if we looked at it like this? Or couldn't it also be this way? You know, don't come on like gangbusters with all this dogma. Come on, you know. You have to be able to justify it in terms of an experience that the other person can relate to. That's why the teachings on consciousness are so important. Because everybody, every living entity, not only every human being, but even animals and plants go through these four states every day. Waking, thinking, dreaming, deep sleep, and as the substrate of it all, Brahman, Turiya. It's universal. It's everywhere. It's in everything. It's everyone. <laughs> so, from this knowledge, knowledge of Brahman, knowledge of the Absolute, is derived everything else. So, if you realize the Absolute, then you actually know everything else because you can easily derive it from basically what you see and feel in the moment. So there's no need, you know, to argue, to fight, to have separation. No, the, there is a need to discuss and build understanding. That's why over the past 12 years, we have developed a language based on the four states of consciousness that describes everything. And you'll see all our videos, especially in the ones in our catalog, are catalog, are <laughs> analyzed in terms of these four states of consciousness. And that is also the basis on which two people with even different points of view can agree, because they're simply in different states of consciousness. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shakti Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya.